Hello, photo viewers. <laughs> Rafael <laughs> the bar here. Welcome to another masterclass. Today we're going to learn how to photograph majestic waterfalls with Mark Denny. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here today with us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Excellent. Can uh, everyone hear me okay? <laughs> well, I think so. I'm going to wait for Sandra. Uh, I, I always say that. Can everyone hear me okay? Thinking that somebody could actually chime in and be like, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we hear you fine, or your audio sounds very rubbish. But um, yes, I see people that. saying in the chat, yeah, I think it's, it's great. And Sandra, uh, the back office audio and video, okay, so we're good to go. So, Mark, for the people that uh, don't know you, who is Mark? Then tell us a bit about your story, what you're doing, what, what do you do? Yeah, excellent. So uh, my name is Mark Denny. I am a full-time landscape photographer. I'm based out of the uh, the great state of North Carolina. I, I haven't always been a photographer, though. I was kind of like, I've been in and out of photography the majority of my life. But really, when I went to, to I guess, high school, all the way through my early 30s, I had nothing to do with photography. I didn't go to school for photography or anything related to the visual arts. And I graduated college. And uh, much like I think a lot of college grads are kind of conditioned to do, you know, I just jumped right into the corporate world and I did that for 17 years uh, and it, it was great. But then, you know, I got kind of burned out on that and uh, my love for photography was kind of like reinvigorated again. And I won't bore you with all the details, but I tried different types of photography from uh, portrait photography and which I was absolutely atrocious at. I'm a, uh, I, I consider myself kind of an, a weird guy. I'm, a, I'm an introvert. And I just felt so uncomfortable telling people like, hey, you know, lift your chin up a little bit or put your shoulders back or look this way, look that way. It was just really weird to me. So I didn't enjoy portrait photography. And I think that when you don't enjoy something, it's going to be really, really difficult to be good at it. So I quickly dismissed that. I was like, all right, if I want to be a photographer, I know I cannot photograph people. And then I, I just kind of stumbled upon landscape photography in the, a, a woodland area near my house. I just happened to walk in there with the camera one day and I just started taking photos and I really enjoyed it. And what kind of resonated with me was the fact that I didn't have to tell the landscape how to present itself. I didn't have to say, you know, hey, mountain, stand up taller. Hey, tree, look this way, look that way. I mean, it, it was all the way it was. So it was just me capturing what was already present. And I really liked that. And I like the, the calming aspect of photography, but mm -hmm. that's kind of how um, a real brief story of, of how I got into to outdoor photography, but I, I, I'm absolutely obsessed with it now. I go to bed thinking about it. I wake up thinking about it. And I'm so grateful to say that it's, it's definitely my full-time job now. I've been uh, doing this full-time now for about almost four years. I think uh, in a couple more months will be my four-year anniversary of full-time outdoor photography, which has been the greatest job I could have uh, ever imagined. It's everything I had hoped it would it would be. But, uh, you know, I, I run workshops. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a, a lot of information on my website. If anybody is interested out there at www.markdennyphotography.com, I've got all my workshops listed there. I've got a YouTube channel. And um, very important sure. YouTube channel, I may yes. say. Yes, <laughs> I love your videos, man. Your uh, I need to learn a lot from you. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I I love doing YouTube. It's a lot of fun. It's it's great interacting with folks, and uh, just creating the videos and editing the videos and just just everything. It's 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 yeah. it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Guys, you want to learn photography? Go and subscribe to Mark's YouTube channel. Is uh, it's cool. It's a gold mine. For Thank you. Yeah, I, I always try and create content. There's a there, I, so I came from the sales world in my corporate job. I was in uh, financial marketing, so I basically helped banks and, and credit unions and mortgage companies become more profitable. So mm -hmm. I was always kind of selling stuff. So I had this like corporate sales jargon, like just driven into my head that I can't get rid of. But there's this saying of always selling to your past self. And I'm always thinking about that when I create my videos, not that I'm selling anything, but I'm just trying to teach to my former self. So like the things that I didn't understand years ago, I'd say, oh, you know what? Well, if, if I struggled with that, maybe if I made a video about it, it might help somebody else. Like I can't be that weird or that unique that I'm the only one that has this concern or this problem. So that's kind of, a, that's kind of where I come up with all my video ideas or just things that I used to struggle with. 
in hopes that uh, might be able to help somebody else out. Very nice, very nice. And where about do you teach workshops uh, in the states or or around the world? So it's uh, it's around the world. Um, this year is mostly U.S. So uh, I got one in Colorado coming up, uh, a couple in Oregon. I'm a, I have a workshop in Iceland coming up in early July that I'm really excited about. But next year, it's going to be a lot of international. So the Lafon Islands, Patagonia, uh, the Dolomites, Greenland. So nice. I'm super, super excited about all of those. So um, if anyone's interested, a shameless plug, I uh, have all the information on my website. You can check that out as well. Awesome. I see that Sandra has been uh, has typed your website on the chat. Great, great, great. Mark, oh, what are we going to learn today? Perfect. So we're going to talk about the thing that I am hands down most excited about, which is which is waterfalls. I um, well, let me let me go ahead and share my screen here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Share, share screen, share screen. All right. Can you see my screen, Raphael? Yes. Photographing okay. majestic waterfalls. Excellent. Yes. So a question that I get all the time is, we you know, why waterfall? So it's something that I, I talk about all the time. It's something that I, I honestly feel pretty passionate about. And I, I never really thought about it. You know, I, I think much like a lot of people, when you when you really like something, you don't really think about why you like it so much. You just like it. So you do it. But after getting the question so many times, you know, like, why do you, you know, what is it about waterfalls you love so much? I, I really kind of started to dig into that to try and figure out, you know, like, why, why is it, Mark? And it's, it's a pretty, I don't know, I, I think it's a good answer. And it, it, well, for one, I live in North Carolina, so, and I live right in the center of the state. So I have very easy access to the Blue Ridge Mountains, where there seems to be just a ne never ending amount of waterfalls in that area. So be being able to access so many waterfalls in just like a two and a half hour drive is really how I started to photograph them. But I started to really revisit the same waterfalls over and over again. And what I started to notice was that every single time, every time that I visited a waterfall, it was completely different. And that was one of the things that I thought was really great about it is because you could revisit the same thing over and over again. And it doesn't look completely different, but it looks substantially different based off of the seasons, of course. You know, waterfalls in the fall look completely different than waterfalls in the winter or spring. And the, the amount of water that's flowing, so how much rain or how little rain has happened to occur, you know, near the time that you're visiting, greatly impacts how much flow of water is pouring over. And that completely changes the amount of water or changes the way a waterfall looks. And personally, I don't like, I don't want to say I don't like, I prefer when waterfalls aren't raging, when it's just like a raging fire hose of water pouring off. I actually prefer waterfalls that have a little bit more of a kind of like a, a trickle a little bit. So you get kind of like striations of water coming down. That's kind of what I prefer. And the reason why I have this photo on the screen here, a uh, real quick story, this image on the left was captured uh, in Kauai in a helicopter. And you can see, if you look close enough, there's just the ever so slight waterfalls streaming down this 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 uh, this cliffside. And it's kind of hard to see the scale here, but this cliffside's got to be, gosh, I don't know, well over a thousand, I don't know, maybe a couple thousand feet. It's massive. And as I'm flying over there and for anyone who knows me, I, I, I don't do well in helicopters. So I was already really, really nervous. And I've got my little headphone things on and, and the, the captain or the pilot comes in and was like, oh my gosh, look over to your left, look over to your left. And I, and I look over and I see this and I don't, you know, I'm like, oh, wow, that's beautiful. And he was saying how he hasn't seen those waterfalls in well over a year. And the only reason you, the only time you do get to see these waterfalls is when there was a ton of rain. And I was there um, unfortunately, it was kind of sad, but I was there uh, right after uh, some pretty historic floods. There was a ton of homes and property that was damaged. And I guess the only good thing that came out of it was the fact that these waterfalls revealed itself. And I kind of think that that's just a good set, uh, kind of a, a lead in to waterfalls is the fact that they change all the time. Sometimes they reveal themselves, sometimes they don't. And this scene on the right is just a uh, scene in central Oregon. And I was told, I've only been to this location one time, that this is a lot of water for this particular creek. It's really not even a river. It's more like a creek. 
or it's a larger creek, I guess you could say, but there was a lot of water flowing at this particular time. So if I went at this location at any other time, maybe the water wouldn't be at this particular level. So it would be completely different. So the fact that these waterfalls, this is a very long-winded answer and I apologize. <laughs> it's just the fact that waterfalls change all the time. The water's changing, the seasons are changing. Whenever there's water flowing through anything, it's gonna naturally change the landscape. So it's always evolving. So it's just kind of like a never ending subject to photograph. Now, as far as camera gear is concerned, it's probably one of the, the most common questions, you know, it's like, what are the, what kind of gear do you need for, for waterfall photography? This, what you see on your screen right now is the, obviously extremely basic, you know, tripod, wide angle lens, long lens and a camera. I think we all, we all know that. But as far as the things that I find are kind of more tied to waterfall photography, so things like a shutter release. I personally don't use shutter releases because, one, it's just one more thing to purchase. It's one more thing to carry. It's one more thing to plug into your camera. But I actually like to use a two or a 10 second timer in the camera. But okay. Yeah. However you want to do it, I think what's most important is that you're not actually pressing the shutter button because that always introduces a little bit of camera shake. So shutter release, two second timer is important. And uh, lens wipes is very important. Uh, water socks. If um, Raphael, if I wanted to show something, should I just show it now? Yeah, so you just show that really I'll, I'll manage the scenes. Okay, perfect. So, so as far as yeah. water socks are concerned, these. So these are great. These are NRS boundary socks and they are worth their weight in gold. I'm not sponsored by them or anything like this. It's just a product I really believe in, but um, it's got this kind of nice seal at the top here and it makes a waterproof seal around just below your knee. And what's great is not only will it keep your feet uh, dry, it'll keep your feet uh, warm as well. And as you can see, there's, there's no like shoe on the bottom here. So what I do is I just bought these kind of like water shoes. They're, uh, speedos <laughs> speedo water shoes like i i think those are like ten dollars from walmart and i just basically slip these on top of these uh the mm -hmm. boundary box and it's such an amazing solution because and we'll get to this in a minute when we talk about composition for uh, for waterfalls but i really believe that the best compositions for waterfalls are actually in the water when it's safe of course not swimming around to your shoulders but you know getting in to sometimes up to your knee but uh, these water socks and our uh, NRF boundary socks are, are fantastic. They're kind of expensive. I think I paid like $80, but I've had mine for five or six years and uh, no issues with them at all. So I, I think that uh, it's definitely an important thing. It doesn't have to be that brand, but having some type of way to get in the water without completely drenching your boots or your pants or anything like that, I think is important. And then- Definitely, yeah. You need to get- to where the photo is right get wet get get in the water it's yeah because you. you know a lot of people i don't want to say most people but a lot of people photograph waterfalls from the shore and mm -hmm. most of the time when you're photographing a waterfall from the shore you're kind of photographing it on an angle and you're kind of photographing it where everybody else photographs it as well so if you want to create something very unique and very immersive a lot of times the best way to do that is just to get in where the action is and that's get into the water which um, one, I think it's a lot of fun. That might be the, the kid coming out at me. I love getting in the water, but um, it does create some, some pretty interesting photographs as well. And then filters. So full disclosure, I am a, a Nisi ambassador. I'm sponsored by Nisi, but I have been using Nisi filters way before I became affiliated with them. But a solid neutral density filter is, is important. It depends what type of waterfall photography you're into. If you want to create, you know, much longer exposures. I personally don't use a ton of solid neutral densities. I, I own a, a three stop, a six stop and a 10 stop, but I really only use the three stop and it's on a very rare occurrence. And this image right here, I'm really proud of this photograph. This is uh, a waterfall in North Carolina from, from actually quite a few years ago. This is one of my earlier waterfall photos, but uh, it was you really can't tell in this photograph, but it was it was kind of a brighter morning. It was maybe mid morning. There's a little bit of fog and mist kind of rolling through, which you can kind of see in the upper right hand corner. But I put on a, a three stop solid ND filter and kind of and slowed this this my shutter speed down to I think I'm going off of memory here, which isn't too too reliable anymore. But I think it's like 
maybe a three or, or a five second exposure, but it just mm -hmm. created this very, just kind of soft and just very ethereal, almost kind of like dreamlike look. So a lot of times if you, if you really want to go for those extended, you know, drug out shutter speeds, a lot of times you need a, a solid ND to do that. But what I think is hands down the most uh, important um, filter to have is a circular polarizer. And I use, uh, of course, Nisi polarizers. This is one that I've been using a lot lately. This is their new kind of true color, which is supposed to have no color cast to it, which I haven't noticed any color cast. But uh, to be honest with you, I haven't noticed any color cast in any other circular polarizers, but this one is fantastic like they all are. But in my opinion, if you're photographing really anything outdoors, but especially anything with moving water, having a circular polarizer on the end of your lens is absolutely imperative. And I got a really, really cool example right here. Uh, once again, a, another waterfall in North Carolina. And as you can see by the title of this slide, there is no polarizer attached to my lens in this particular image. And you can see, you know, all that glare, all the, the shine where things are wet. And I think that most people know that, you know, polarizer removes that kind of sheen, that reflection off of wet surfaces. But I want you to pay attention to the leaves as well, because this is what I think is, is kind of where the real magic happens with polarizers. So this next image here is with the polarizer. And if you look at the, the leaves on the left hand side, when I go back and forth here, so this right here is no polarizer and with the polarizer. And I'm just going to kind of rock this back and forth so you can see that. But if you just pay attention to the leaves on the left hand side, you can see what that's doing. And this is kind of where that that you probably have heard people say that a polarizer saturates colors, it saturates greens, and that's not really true. Polarizers really don't saturate colors, but what they do is they remove that reflection off the top of leaves, and that reflection is caused from the sun or the clouds. I'm going to go back and forth again here. You can really see it on the left-hand side. That's really what it's doing. And when you cut through that reflection off the top of these leaves, that gives the illusion that the color is much more vibrant and much more rich and much deeper. So I think that's one of the, the, the best things about a circular polarizer, along with the fact that it removes a lot of that reflection from the water as well. So here's another example. If you, if you look at the rock to the left and to the right of the waterfall, you can really see the difference here of what that polarizer is doing. And that's just an Definitely. absolute, yeah, it, it's it's a huge, huge difference. So I think that uh, the, a circular polarizer is an absolute must have. And um, I forgot to mention too, I, I as far as lenses go, you know, I'll kind of touch upon this when we talk about composition here in a few minutes, but the lenses I use, I use this, I use the Fuji GFX 100S. This is the 32 to 64, which is kind of a, a mid-range zoom, which is fantastic. And then a, a telephoto lens, I think is great, which seems kind of odd. I think that a lot of people don't think of longer lenses when it comes to photographing waterfalls, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into this in, in a few minutes. But I think it's probably my favorite focal length is a longer focal length to photograph waterfalls. But probably the most common is a wide angle lens. This is what I use. It's a, a 23 millimeter prime. This is a medium format lens. So I believe that's like the equivalent of 18 millimeters full frame. So it, it's pretty wide. Mm -hmm. But I think what's most important when you're photographing waterfalls is to have a little bit of diversity with your with your lenses. You don't have to bring, you know, six or eight lenses if you happen to own that many. I only own three lenses. But um, I think just having a variety of focal lengths is, is what's really most important to kind of tell that story of a waterfall. Now, it, as far as composition is concerned, I think this is everybody's um, favorite topic next to gear, of course, but <laughs> photographing waterfalls can be a little bit tricky. And we touched upon this in the, the very beginning about getting in the water. You know, I call it getting low to the flow. And I think one of the easiest things you can do is go to where the outflow of the waterfall is because it creates these just very natural leading lines and all of this kind of white area the splash that creates the leading line kind of drawing the viewer's eye up and into your photograph and getting in the water and i always like to get my camera i should preface this too you know you definitely want to make sure that it's safe if the, if the waterfall is raging you probably don't want to get in that water but if it's a little bit calmer and you, and you feel safe, you have good footing, 
you know, getting low to the flow is, is great. So, you know, getting your, your tripod in the water and I like to get my camera, you know, maybe a foot above the actual surface of the water and get that water almost kind of flowing right beneath the lens. And that really creates a very immersive photograph as you, as you can see here, it's one of my favorite aspects of this photo outside of the, the autumn colors. It's just how immersive that water kind of pouring into the front of the viewer in the foreground kind of creates that feeling, which I, which is fantastic. And I think also having a sturdy tripod is pretty important too, for if, if you want to actually get in the water, because that water is flowing pr usually pretty quickly past your tripod legs. And that can kind of create a little bit of movement, especially if you're using maybe a solid ND filter and you're having, you know, maybe a two or five, or maybe a, a 10 second exposure, any movement can create camera blur. So a sturdy tripod is, is really important as well. But getting in the water, getting low to the flow is a great way to, to create those immersive photographs. Um, Raphael, do, do we have any questions so far? Not at the moment. Uh, so, you can continue. so as far as supporting elements are concerned, now this is something that I always found was kind of difficult because at least in the US, a lot of the waterfalls we encounter are in woodland areas. So there's always trees around. And the problem is whenever there's trees around, that means there's also fallen trees. And this kind of goes back to what we were saying in the very beginning is how waterfalls are always changing. The seasons change, the amount of water changes, the flow changes, but also the areas surrounding the waterfalls change as well. So I can't tell you how many times I've come to, um, actually this scene right here, I came to this waterfall and I noticed that there was a giant log towards the left-hand side of the screen that had fallen. It was never, it was not there a couple of years ago. So you always have to kind of figure out, you know, what's the area around the waterfall? What are the things that I can include in my photograph that can help tell this story? And also on the flip side of that, what are the things I wanna exclude? So this area right through here, I thought that this was a pretty good use of this kind of just fallen log that uh, wasn't there when the very first time I was at this particular waterfall, but just getting very, very close to the base of this log. It's got some interesting texture to it. It was using a very wide angle lens. This log really wasn't as big as it appears in this photograph, but just kind of using that to my advantage. I don't, I don't go to the gym a whole lot. I probably should, but that log was far <laughs> too big for me to, to, to try and pick up or move. I just had to kind of work with it. So just kind of being cognizant and aware of the things that you can put in your composition that kind of help support your case, kind of help tell your story and help build your composition. And like I said, on the flip side of that, there's distractions. And this is where I think it gets kind of difficult. So this is that log. You can see this is one of the first compositions I came up with when I was photographing this waterfall. And I really loved it. I love the clovers in the bottom left hand screen of the screen. This is a completely unedited image. This is raw, straight out of camera. But I love the log in the bottom right hand corner. I love how the outflow of the waterfall was going beneath that log, because to me, that created a lot of depth down there. You know, I almost feel like I could reach into the bottom of the screen and touch that waterfall, even though it's running beneath that, that log. And I thought that was fantastic. And I still, this is still my favorite composition, but that log in the middle of the frame on the left side was just such an eyesore. It completely ruined it. And as much as I love this composition, there was just no way I could really get beyond that. And it was too big to probably cleanly try and remove with Photoshop wizardry or anything like that. So I had to move on. And this is the ultimate uh, composition that I ended up going with. And as you can still, you, you can still see that log on the left-hand side. But just by kind of moving over to the right, I was able to, to diminish how much that log is in the frame and just using some kind of dodging and burning and kind of darkening that side down. It's not nearly as prominent anymore. And I still have that nice kind of outflow of the water going through the upper right hand corner of the screen all the way down through the bottom left hand corner of the screen. And I really like the way that this came out. But just being aware of the distractions in your photograph. Now a really big issue with waterfall photography is the empty mm -hmm. sky. So I would, I'm always leery about saying things like most, most waterfalls or all waterfalls, but many waterfalls that I've encountered, they usually have, if you want to capture the top of the waterfall, you're going to get a little bit of the empty sky up there. 
I think the empty sky in this scenario is okay because there's a, a nice layer of mist rolling over the top of this mountain. And I think it works okay. But a lot of times you, you, you'll photograph a waterfall and you want to capture the whole waterfall and you want to get the top of the water, top of the water falling. But you have this kind of like a lot of times it's a V, a V of just nothing, of just plain sky. So it's not always easy to, to solve for. But I think just being aware of it will help you to maybe think about your composition a little bit differently or maybe compose it a little bit tighter or maybe just embrace it. But I think just being aware that the empty sky could pose a distraction in your photograph is pretty powerful. It's pretty important. Yeah, totally. Have you ever tried to uh, put somebody on top of the waterfall to, <laughs> to give some, some interesting <laughs> human figure up there? No. So I, I do like uh, the human element in photographs, but I very rarely ever do it, mainly because, you know, and I kicked off this talk the same mm -hmm. way saying this, but I feel like I'm a, I'm a kind of a weird guy. I'm a, I'm a loner. Or I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. So most of the time that I do um, any kind of photography is usually by myself, unless it's on a workshop. So I usually don't have anybody to, to photograph. And my camera only has a 10 second timer. And I am no, mm -hmm. I am not quick enough to, to go ahead and start the exposure <laughs> and run up there. I guess I could just do a, a constant interval timer, but um, no, I, I usually, I don't uh, put anyone at the top, cool, but cool. that's, that's a good, that's a good suggestion because that will definitely break up the monotony of just having a, a blank area in the top of your screen. Cause that's kind of a distraction in itself. As you know, I'm not a photographer, I'm just uh, busy, busy <laughs> <laughs> fan. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now, my favorite aspect of photography, and anyone who watches any of my YouTube videos will, will have probably have heard me spoke, speak about this, and it's storytelling. And I personally feel that one of the most powerful things you can do in a photograph is evoke some type of emotion in somebody. And, that, and I'm not saying that when someone sees your photograph, they just start completely bawling in tears, but just getting them to feel something, whether they feel peaceful, Maybe they feel somber. Maybe it does make them cry. Maybe it makes them excited or angry or tense or whatever the emotion is. But when you can get someone to feel something by looking at your photograph, I think that's a very, very powerful thing. And I think a great way to do that is through visual storytelling. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. I'm sure if you talk to other photographers, they might have a way that's a little bit different than mine. But I want to share with you kind of the way that I go about storytelling uh, with photography, but as it specifically relates to, to waterfalls. So in this particular scene here, well, let me just go to the next side. So this is, I'm sure everyone has noticed this waterfall before. This is uh, in Iceland. And the image on the left-hand side, of course, is capturing the entire waterfall. And the image on the right-hand side is a just a very small sliver I believe it was in the bottom left-hand corner of the water crashing. So the image on the left was taken with my 32 to 64, which uh, mm -hmm. at its widest focal length, which is pretty wide. And then the image on the right is a telephoto. So I think one of the most amazing ways to tell a story, not just waterfalls, really any kind of a landscape, is to create a variety. So if, um, if there's any movie buffs out there, whenever mm -hmm. a company is in say Hollywood and they're pitching a movie idea to uh, producers or an investment company, they always create something that's called a storyboard. And this storyboard is basically a visual synopsis in photographs of the story of the movie that someone is trying to tell or the movie that a company is trying to pitch. And they basically do this, they, it's almost like a comic book. And I always try and create storyboards of locations as well. So whenever I'm photographing a waterfall or, or anything, really, I want to try and create at least three versions of that waterfall. So and that's usually a wide angle shot, a telephoto, more intimate scene. And then the third photograph is kind of just a wild card, whatever I see out there that I think would be a good representation of this location. So as you can see here, image on the left, wide angle shot shows the entire waterfall. The image on the right telephoto shot, intimate detail, kind of shows the, the ferocious nature, how powerful, how dynamic, and how much energy is in this waterfall. And then this next image right here is just a real intimate detail of the very base of the waterfall. The, you actually don't even see the water falling. This is just the mist of the waterfall. It's a nice little rainbow form, a little bit of light peaked out just to show the little, little tiny tip 
of that rock in the bottom right hand corner. But this is just a good example. So these three images together, I don't know why I didn't do this. I should have created a slide with all three of these photographs together on it. But these three images together tells the story, I think, a lot better as opposed to if I just had that wide angle shot of that of that waterfall, which I think is is what a lot of people do. I know it's what I certainly used to do when I would photograph a waterfall. I, a lot of times I'd only bring one lens. I would just bring my widest lens and I would only focus on how can I capture this entire waterfall. But then when I started to think about, OK, how can I not get so fixated on capturing the entire waterfall? How can I tell the story better of this waterfall? And I think the best way to do that is by slapping on different focal lengths of your camera. It'll automa automatically, automatically get you to photograph different details of your scene. And I think it's an amazing way to just tell a story of a particular location. And once again, just another intimate scene of a waterfall, just zooming into the water and how it's interacting with the rocks or how it's interacting with the trees below. I have this infatuation excuse me, with uh, the base of waterfalls. So where the waterfall is actually crashing. I absolutely love that. And what I really like about this scene, one, you have no idea where this could be. It could be in the US, it could be anywhere in the world. And you really don't have no, you have no idea how big this waterfall is. And I love the kind of momentary bit of confusion that this type of a scene can cause because you really can't see what is around this. You know, this could just be a small little waterfall. It could be massive. It could be in Iceland. It could be in, in Tennessee somewhere. Uh, full disclosure, it's in Oregon. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I like photographs that kind of hold something back a little bit, doesn't reveal the entire scene because I think it, it creates a little bit of curiosity, creates a little bit of confusion in the viewer. And I think the longer you can get a viewer to look at your photograph, the longer you can get them to kind of just sit there and ponder and think about it, that's 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 a good thing. You know, if uh, sometimes I look at some of my photographs and I'll look at it for one second and then just move on to something else. In other photographs, I'll look at it and I don't look at any of them for like 10 minutes or anything like that. But sometimes <laughs> I might look at it for like 10 seconds or maybe 20 seconds. And it might not seem like a big difference. Someone looking at your photo for one second versus 20 seconds. But it really is a massive, massive difference. So if you can hold that viewer's attention a little bit longer, I think that's a pretty powerful thing. And I think creating intimate, detailed shots of waterfalls is a fantastic way to do that. Now, mm -hmm. camera settings. So this is probably one of the more common questions, not just with, with waterfall photography, with really just any kind of photography is related to the, the camera settings. You know, what are the, the best camera settings for, for waterfall photography? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say there isn't an answer. If there is an answer, I don't know what it is. But to me, mm -hmm. what, what's so difficult about it is that, you know, I think, I think a lot of people, I mean, I used to want to know too, you know, like what's the best shutter speed? And it's impossible to tell because the amount of water flow is so dependent on the shutter speed that you're shooting on. So if the water is absolutely raging, a 1 25th of a second uh, shutter speed is going to look completely different as opposed to if the waterfall is just a small trickle. So the flow of the water is definitely going to determine the shutter speed that you use. Now, when you're when you go to think about the uh, the, the camera settings you want to 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 dial in to tell a story of a photograph, I think paying attention to the saying at the top of the screen, which is the end in mind. Once again, this is a little bit of a carryover from my days in the corporate world, but that's a very kind of corporate America thing saying that the end in mind. But I think it, it really translates to photography well, too. And what I mean by that is thinking to yourself, you know, what, Mark, what's what's the story I want to tell with this waterfall? What is that end in mind? And when you think about that, when you have the idea in your mind, of the story you want to tell before you pick your camera settings, it is absolutely going to, it's going to alter the camera settings that you choose. I'll show you what I mean right here. So in my mind, when it comes to moving, uh, I should say photographing, moving water, shutter speed is king. It is the most powerful thing, way more powerful than aperture, more powerful than any type of ISO you might dial in. Shutter speed is going to tell the story. So I showed this image a few moments, moments ago, and I had talked about how this is a very slow shutter speed. This is a much slower shutter speed than I normally use. But this slower shutter speed creates this very calming effect. 
it creates this very ethereal. It, this image feels very peaceful. It feels very quiet. And that's what a slow shutter speed can create. So when your foot, when you when you encounter a waterfall, if you feel that and you want to create that calm, peaceful feeling, you're not going to want to use a fast shutter speed. You're going to want to use a slow shutter speed to smooth it all out, smooth out the water, because that's going to add to that calming effect. That's going to add to that ethereal, peaceful and quiet scene. Now, if you are photographing a, a large waterfall, this is the, the base of Yosemite Falls in Yosemite National Park, which is an absolutely colossal waterfall. It's huge. And I was fortunate enough to be there one spring when there was a, a, a heavy snowfall the winter prior and prior to the spring. And as soon as all that snow started to melt, these waterfalls were just absolutely raging that year. And I really wanted to tell that story of that ferocious nature. Now, if I took this scene with... Uh, you know, a 15 second shutter speed, this image would not have the same feeling that this image has where it was captured with a much faster shutter speed. So generally speaking, a fast shutter speed will always result in this kind of, you know, powerful, high dynamic, uh, energetic and forceful feeling in the scene. And it's one of the, I feel like a nerd sometimes getting so excited about shutter speed, but I find it to be absolutely incredible because shutter speed can create an illusion that we can't see with our eyes. You know, the only way to see it is, is with a camera. So our eyes don't see a fast shutter speed. Our eyes certainly don't see a slow shutter speed, but cameras can. And I think that's really, really cool. And this is just a good example, or not this right here. This is just another example of, of using a fast shutter speed. Zooming in, this is the, the base of Bridal Veil Falls, also in Yosemite. But just kind of using a very quick shutter speed to freeze that water falling mm. creates that ferocious nature. And I think this is a great representation of it here, of uh, an image captured mm. on the left-hand side with 1 60th of a second, and then an image on the right side captured at two seconds. And I think you would agree that the fast shutter speed version and the slow shutter speed version looks absolutely, it, it's completely different. Now, I don't think the image on the left-hand side definitely has a real ferocious nature, but it does feel a little bit more energetic to me than the image on the right-hand side. So whenever you're photographing, whether it's waterfalls or any kind of moving water, pay attention to how you're feeling before you really start to compose your photograph and before you start to dial in particular camera settings, because it's going to really determine how slow of a shutter speed or how fast of a shutter speed you want to apply. Here's a, another good example here. Very fast shutter speed on the left hand side, one two hundredth of a second versus half a second on the right hand side. Once again, just a completely different feeling. And the only thing that has changed here is just the shutter speed. That is it. And I, I think that's I think that's pretty cool. Now, as far as my favorite shutter speed is something that I call a blended shutter speed. And we're going to also get into this a little bit further when we go into a little bit of post processing. But for me, my favorite shutter speed is something that is not really fast, it's not super slow, but my ultimate goal is to show movement in the water while at the same time retaining as much detail as I possibly can. That's always my goal. So I don't want the water to look like it's frozen. I want the water to show movement, but I also want to try and figure out how much detail I can also retain while showing that movement at the same time. So it's a little bit of a, a seesaw, it's a little bit of a balancing act. And to kind of just give you a range of shutter speeds, for me, it's usually somewhere between maybe a 25th of a second and a fifth of a second. Somewhere in that range is usually where I start. But I would definitely encourage you, uh, next time you are photographing moving water, whether it's a river or a creek or a waterfall or, or whatever it is, to take a variety of different shutter speeds. So take some really long shutter speed images. Take some very fast shutter speed. Take some that are kind of blended in between as well. Because it's ultimately going to give you a variety a variety to look at when you get back home. And I can't tell you how many times I go to edit a photograph from a waterfall trip a couple months ago, maybe. And I'm looking at the photographs and the shutter speed that I liked the most when I was on location is not the, my favorite when I'm going to look at these images on a computer. So I think it's important to not find the shutter speed that you think is the best and just kind of hammering away at that and taking you know, 50 versions of that same shutter speed, but 
get a variety because once you get back home, you'll be happy you did because you'll have a bunch of different shutter speeds to choose from. And you can actually create multiple different versions of the same scene, fast shutter speed, slow shutter speed, kind of a blended shutter speed, and just figure out what you like then. Yeah, definitely. It's like it's like the angle, right? Yeah, you can try several angles uh, of a waterfall, and, and then you'll decide which one I think you prefer yeah, at the end of the day, right? Yeah, that was one of the things that I struggled with so much when I first got started with photography. Is I would get so fixated on one composition, mm -hmm. and I was always afraid that I was going to miss the best light, or maybe fog was going to roll in, or I was going to miss the moment when the color was the most vibrant in the sky. And what that resulted in was me finding a composition and just hammering away at that composition. I would come home with hundreds, 150 of this, pretty much the same exact image, um, mm -hmm. just over and over and over again. And yeah, it works out a lot of times when you do it like that, because you kind of guarantee that you're going to get the most vibrant color in that sunrise or sunset, because you basically created like a time lapse of that sunrise mm -hmm. and that sunset. <laughs> but what I was finding is that I felt like I wasn't very productive because I would travel, you know, three hour drive and, you know, a two hour hike and then you're at the location for four hours and then you drive home and the whole thing was like, you know, a 12 hour day all to capture one final image. So I felt like I wasn't being very productive when I was on location and it kind of goes hand in hand composition and different shutter speeds as well trying to figure out exactly you know what's the best way to maximize your time when you're on location it's pretty important now uh, this is just a, another example from uh, a recent trip to, to zion just a, a blended shutter speed as you know this isn't a big waterfall but you can see the water in the bottom of the frame you can definitely see that the water is moving but you also see a little bit of that detail as well now um aperture so i personally don't think that I, I i really don't put a whole lot of thought into the aperture that i use when i when i'm photographing waterfalls i generally want everything in my scene to be in sharp focus so it's usually somewhere between f11 and f16 um i would like to kind of start experimenting a little bit more with um you know, larger apertures and maybe throwing some areas in the foreground out of focus a little bit, having the waterfall in the background in focus. But generally speaking, I'm somewhere between F11 and F16. And I like to think of ISO is uh, something called shutter speed support. And I think this is very, very, very important because what will happen a lot of times is when you get on location and let's say you're at F11, you've got your composition dialed in, and you're, you're experimenting with different shutter speeds. And let's say that 1 one twenty one twenty fifth of a second, that's the shutter speed that you think that that water looks the best, that creates the right amount of movement in your scene. It also shows the amount of detail that you want in the water, and 1 25th is the way to go. But then you look at the back of your camera and you notice that your, your histogram is piled all the way up on the left, or your exposure meter is showing that your image is two stops underexposed. So there's a couple of things you could do to resolve that. We all know that you could open up your aperture to allow more light in, but that's going to completely change the way your overall photograph looks. You know, it's going to completely change the depth of field. So you really don't want to do that. And you absolutely do not want to change your shutter speed because if you say, you know, change your shutter speed from 1 25th of a second to one second to allow more light into your, your sensor, well, yeah, your image is going to be better exposed now, but now your water looks completely different. So you don't want to do that either. So you want to leave your aperture alone. You want to leave your shutter speed alone. But this is where you can really lean on ISO. And that's why I call it the, the triple S, the shutter speed support, because that's how I like to think of ISO is it's it's a, a tool that enables me to keep the exact shutter speed that I want. So instead of changing the shutter speed or opening up my aperture, just bump your ISO up a little bit from maybe 100 to 200 or 200 to 400, or bump it up to 640. You know, I mean, I take my camera up to 1600 all the time and I see no, no noise at all. You know, I think cameras today are so good at creating, you know, wonderfully clean photographs at much higher ISO levels. So I would don't don't be afraid you know, to crank up your ISO a little bit to help support the shutter speed that you need, because that shutter speed is by far the most important thing to photographing waterfalls or any type of moving water 
because that's going to tell the story. That's going to create that emotion in the viewer and tell the story of your time spent at that particular location. So I, I really harp on the ISO because this kind of goes back to me teaching to my former self, at least that thought track, because I was always so fixated on having my ISO as low as I possibly could go. I would always have it set. I keep looking over here because I got my camera here, but I would always keep my ISO level set at 100 always because I used to watch, you know, other YouTubers or other, you know, landscape photographers and read articles and podcasts I would listen to. And it seemed like all the pros were always using ISO 100 and I wasn't going to, you know, who am I to, to change that? So I was like, well, you got to use ISO 100 mark if you want to get a clean photograph. And I remember sometimes if I had to change my ISO from 100 to 200, I, I put a lot of thought into it. I was so nervous, like, oh, my gosh, am I going to ruin my scene if I do this? But in all actuality, you feel free to crank that ISO up a little bit. You're, you're not going to see much image degradation at all. Maybe if you zoom in to, you know, 500 percent, you can see a little noise. But the only people that look at images like that are us photographers. Most people don't zoom into photographs like that. So using the ISO to support, support your shutter speed, I think is really important. Now, as far as post-processing is concerned, uh, Raphael, before we jump into post-processing, are there any questions? Yes, there are a few questions here. Okay. And uh, I do apologize because it seems that my sound is a bit weird today. What's going on here? Oh, is that your sound? Yeah. I thought that was actually my sound. I kept looking around and trying to figure out, like, what is that sound? No, I think it's mine. It's mine. Oh, is it? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, it's weird. Okay. Uh, Ray, uh, Valentin, do you weight down your tripod in the stream? I usually don't. I have before, but I, I generally don't. Now, the, the reason that I think I can get away with that is because I generally don't shoot very long exposures when I'm in the water. I'm almost always around a 25th of a second to about a fifth of a second. And that's usually quick enough to not get any kind of real, you know, uh, or I should say it's quick enough that my camera is not going to pick up any kind of vibration from the water. Plus, I'm always um, pretty, pretty cognizant of safety. So I always want to make sure that the water that I'm in is not just raging against the camera or my myself. I want to live to, to photograph another day. So I, I usually don't get into the, the water that was absolutely just, just gushing towards me. But from my experience, if there's just kind of a moderate flow that, um, you know, most sturdier tripods can, can absorb that. And now uh, I don't want to sound like a, a tripod spokesperson because I'm definitely not. But I do know that carbon fiber tripods are really great because not only do they... Um, look cool <laughs> they're lightweight but they also kind of to absorb a little bit of that vibration and, and that little bit of that any kind of flexing that could occur so a carbon fiber tripod is great for for kind of mitigating just very very subtle vibrations as well i hope that answered your question cool 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 thank you thank you thank you then we have uh, donna millet uh, what is your favorite perspective or approach when photographing very long thin waterfalls could, could you repeat it? I, I missed the first part. Yes, uh, what's, uh, what's your favorite perspe uh, perspective or oh. approach when photographing very, very long, thin waterfalls? Oh, that's a good question. It's, um, you know, I would probably have to say that my favorite perspective, it, it, it changes, you know, and I think that's one of the best parts about photography is that, you know, what you enjoyed photographing five years ago is probably a little bit different now. And I think that well, I know my own photography has evolved a lot over the last eight years. And I used to like the images that captured the entire waterfall. That was always my favorite perspective. And now I kind of enjoy the more intimate details of a scene. So if I was photographing a waterfall that had like a nice, you know, huge river or a large outflow, I would absolutely capture the entire scene. But like we were talking about earlier, I would definitely grab, you know, a longer focal length and kind of ask myself or search the scene and kind of survey the scene to something else that you find exciting. Because if something excites you, you're going to want to enjoy it more in your own photography. But if it excites you, it's, there's a good chance it might excite something else. So I'm always looking around with a longer focal length for just a small detail somewhere in the scene that I find interesting, but will also support that much larger photograph as well. And then also just trying to get some kind of like a, a mid-range zoom 
uh, more not intimate scene, but not super wide either. But just ultimately trying to create three perspectives of one single photograph. That's kind of that's not really answering your question. I apologize, <laughs> but I guess. I like a variety of perspectives, wide, <laughs> telephoto, kind of a mid-range. I would have to say all three of those combined would be my my favorite perspective. What a poor answer. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you. Then we have Adrian Nubert. Uh, uh, is there a favorite time for you to take pictures of waterfalls, time of the day, or the year? Yes, so there, okay, there is... Well, I would, I, I guess the fall and the spring are my favorite times of the year. My least favorite time of the year is the winter because the majority of the trees are not going to have leaves on them. But the caveat to that is if the waterfall is frozen or if there's a lot of ice surrounding the waterfall, that is pretty exciting. But um, I, I mean, I would say the summertime might be my least favorite time to photograph waterfall. So I guess spring, fall, and then winter would probably be my three favorite. But as far as uh, weather conditions go, I know you didn't really ask that. That wasn't really the part of your question, but I, I think it's important to, to talk about whenever you get a really cloudy day, I think that's personally the best time to, to photograph waterfalls. And I wish I had an image in this presentation to show, but if you've ever photographed a waterfall on a day where there's not a cloud in the sky and maybe it's high noon, that waterfall doesn't look nearly as photogenic as it does on a cloudy day where the lighting is much more diffused and softer and more even. And the main reason why is because when you get direct light on water, especially moving water, it creates all these like highlights that kind of just pop all over the place. And it looks very distracting. So I think that a cloudy day is by far the best opportunity to capture great waterfall images. And Honestly, most of the time, if, if, I, if I'm if i going to, to shoot waterfalls and there's not a cloud in the sky, I usually won't even go. I'll wait for that day when, that, when it's very overcast and then I'll go. And then the other best thing about that is that you're not chasing any light and it's very relaxing. It's, it's the reason why I got into landscape photography is I found that it was very relaxing. It was very calming. It was very, it kind of got my mind out of the hustle and bustle, you know, rat race of life. And when you're not chasing a, an, an epic sunrise or an epic sunset, and you're not chasing that perfect side light, you're, you have all day, you know, on a good cloudy day, you can have like five hours you could spend and have nice, even light photographing one waterfall, which I think is super cool. It gives you the opportunity to really dig into a location and really get to know it and kind of feel it out and feel uh, what you enjoy most about that photograph. It'll help you, you uh, compose it better. But yeah, I think uh, cloudy days are absolutely imperative. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. We have a few questions uh, okay. left. Uh, do you want to answer them or do you want to continue? Yeah, let's answer one more. And then I just want to show a couple real quick um, uh, uh, post-processing techniques. And then we can just wrap up with the rest. Perfect, perfect. Um, Paul Larson, how do you deal with uh, the dy dynamic range between the water and the surrounding landscape to avoid blowing out the water and keeping good detail in the landscape? Okay, good question. So that's always a, you know, it's something that you always gonna, are going to have to combat against. Now, all waterfalls are a little bit different. The waterfalls that I generally photograph, they seem to always be in a valley a little bit tucked in the mountains, very woodland areas. So there's not a lot of times there's a ton of light that gets into those valleys, especially on cloudy days. But I think that, you know, I, I usually don't have to expose your bracket or anything like that. I usually can get everything in, in one single image. But I think that being very comfortable with your camera is important. And when I mean comfortable, I'm not how to use it, but by how much you can underexpose a scene, and still be able to pull out clean set shadows. So, so my camera here, I've been using this for about a year and a half now, and I'm very comfortable with how much I can underexpose an image and still pull out as much detail, clean detail out of the shadows. So I think that's really important. And if, you, if you're not sure what that threshold is, next time you're on location and the scene kind of presents itself that you could test this out, I'd, I'd encourage you to try that out and Take a couple images of your seam, one stop underexposed, two stop, three stop, four stops underexposed. Then take those images back into your editing software of choice and start cranking up those shadows a little bit and figure out exactly what is the threshold on your camera 
in your mind that you can pull out clean detail in the shadows. That's really important to, to know. But most of the time I can just get it all in, in a single shot. And, and like I said earlier, the shutter speed is by far the most important thing. So uh, that's the that's where I kind of start on all of my camera settings is figuring out what that exact uh, um, that shutter speed should be to help tell the story. And if I have to go from maybe F11 to F16 to control the amount of light, uh, I'll do that. Or maybe if I have to change the ISO level, I'll do that just to kind of try and get the scene as properly exposed as possible. Hopefully that helped with the question. Fantastic, fantastic advice. Cool. Anything? <laughs> yes. So I want to show, so we were talking earlier, let me come up here to the develop module. So we were talking earlier about I, my favorite shutter speed, which is, I call it a blended shutter speed. And I probably should change that name because I, I've heard some confusion that some people thought that I was talking about actually blending two shutter speeds together. And, and it's not that, but it's basically just showing movement by, while also showing as much detail as possible. So in this image right here, there's just some very basic um, edits done here, nothing real fancy. But what I like to do to really bring out that detail in the water. So I like the shutter speed that was used here. You can definitely see that that water is moving. But what I'll let me move my camera here. What I like to do is to use local adjustments, a lot of times radial masks or the paintbrush to bring that detail out a little bit more. So what I'm going to do, let's go over here to the brush. I'm going to set my flow. Yeah, yeah, I'll set it. We'll leave it at 100. And I'm going to leave the feather usually around 75 is kind of my go to. I'm going to brighten or I'm going to enlarge the paintbrush a little bit here. And let me just reset this. I'm just going to start painting over the water through here. There's a little bit of a lag because I'm just screen record, but I'm just going to paint all over this area right through here. And I'm, as you can see, I'm not getting super technical. Sometimes I'll actually refine this with a range mask inside of Lightroom, or you could use luminosity masking inside of Photoshop or Capture One or, or, or whatever uh, editing platform you want to use. But one of my favorite things to do is just to create some kind of mask on the outflow of water and just bringing down the highlights of that water. And as I rock this back and forth, you can see what that's doing. It This is where it was before and now here. So back and forth, back and forth. Now it made the water kind of unrealistically blue. So you want to account for that as well. But what I like to do is bring it down to maybe about right there. It looks pretty good. And I'm going to bring the whites up a little bit as well because I want the water to stand out. Because when you bring the highlights down, you're actually making it darker too. So I don't want the water to become dark, but I also want to bring a lot of the detail that comes by reducing the highlights. So I almost will always reduce the highlights in the water, bump up the whites a little bit, do something about, you know, nothing like that, but maybe quite a bit somewhere right here. Adding clarity to water sometimes can add a, a nice little effect as well. You want to be careful though, because as we all know, water's soft, water's fluid. You don't want to have crunchy, sharp looking water, but definitely increasing clarity a little bit, maybe even texture will add a little bit of more detail to the water as well. So if we turn this kind of on and off, you can see what that did right there. That's before and after, before and after. And I don't really like the, the blue. It kind of added a little bit of blue in there. So I'm going to kind of reduce that blue saturation channel. Just kind of take that out a little bit. But I like the way that that looks right there. Once again, I'll kind of toggle this on and off. So almost every waterfall or, or any photograph that I create that has moving water, I almost always edit the water itself to try and bring out as much detail as I possibly can. Uh, something else I like to do too, let me come up here to, uh, uh, actually, you know what, let me do it on this, this image here. So this is kind of a, a cool trick and it's, it's something that I didn't think that I would use very often, but once I learned how to do it, I found so many situations where this was, uh, this was helpful. So you might recognize this photograph. This is from a, uh, from the presentation earlier and very long shutter speed right through here. I love the ethereal quality of it. It's very peaceful, but the problem is, is that, and this is a very common problem 
is that when you're photographing waterfalls, a lot of times those waterfalls are surrounded by trees. And those trees usually have leaves on them. So when you're doing a five or maybe six, seven, 10 second long exposure, if there is any wind at all, these leaves are going to get blurry, blurried, and they're going to blur. So that's a problem. So you don't want to have, you know, this beautiful waterfall. You love the shutter speed that you have, but then all your leaves are blurry. And then if you speed up your shutter speed, okay, now I've got, once my computer catches up, now I've got perfectly sharp leaves, no blur at all. But now I've got this type of a shutter speed, or uh, I should say look in the water because I had to use a much faster shutter speed to freeze those waters or freeze, sorry, freeze the leaves. So you can kind of see the, the conundrum that we have here. So what I like to do, let me minimize this, is, and I already brought this into Photoshop here. So I, what I will do is I will open up both of those photographs inside of Photoshop. So the image on the bottom here, this is the slow shutter speed. So let me just label this slow. And then this image on the top, is the fast shutter speed. So let me label this fast, so they can just stay organized. So the fast shutter speed is on top of the slow. And what I will do is I'll come up here to fast and I'm gonna put a layer mask on here. And this layer mask is completely white. And if you remember the saying, white reveals and black conceals. So anything that is covered in white is gonna reveal itself and anything that is black is going to conceal. So if I come up here and I already have black highlighted in my paintbrush, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to have my hardness set at soft and my flow and opacity both at 100% that you can see here. And I'll zoom in so you can see this easier. And I'm going to just kind of paint over this area. And what I'm doing is I'm basically allowing this bottom, this bottom composition, or I should say this bottom image, to bleed through this one right here. And you can see the little black area in the layer mask. And I'm just going to paint all over here to kind of bring this in. And we'll do it here. It's pretty cool when you watch it. Up and down. All through here. Going to go all the around. Nice. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And you don't have to get super granular. You know, it's going to go through here. I mean, you could you, you could get super technical with this. But that is a super cool way. And like you can see right here, the, the, the area that we painted through to allow the slower shutter speed version of that waterfall to bleed through. And when I kind of toggle this on and off, you can see where we're at. But what is so cool is now, let me zoom in here. Now we have the shutter speed of the waterfall that we want, but we also have perfectly sharp leaves right here as well, as you can see there. So that's a really, really cool technique. And when I first figured, learned how to do that, I was thinking to myself, you know, you know, Mark, how how often are you really going to use that? Because I'm I'm a, a one exposure guy. I always try and capture my images in one shot. I try not to do a whole lot of focus stacking or exposure bracketing or exposure blending or anything like that. But when I learned how to do this, I was thinking to myself, well, that's not something you're going to use a whole lot, Mark, because you're going to have to start taking multiple images. But when I realized how simple this was to do as you can see we just ran through this in a matter of uh, a minute or two it really opened my eyes a lot so the next time you're you're photographing uh, any any type of moving water if you're using a longer shutter speed and you you know you capture your photograph and you're looking on the back of your camera and you're reviewing your photo zoom into any leaves that are prominent in your scene and zoom all the way in and if those leaves are really really blurry you might want to think about doing this technique where you have your, your composition set and you want to make sure you don't change your composition at all. Don't change your aperture or anything. All you're going to really do is just change your, uh, your shutter speed and uh, capture a fast image to freeze the, the leaves, a slower version to capture the, uh, the, the waterfall or whatever shutter speed you want for the waterfall. And then you can easily blend those together in Photoshop. So I, I hope that was helpful there. But uh, those are, are you know, I, I don't use this technique all the time, but I definitely use it way, way more often than I ever thought I would. But those are definitely is a very, very, very useful piece. Huh? Yeah, those are two things that so simple. Uh, yeah, very, very simple. Let me uh, stop the screen share here. But yeah, like I was saying, the every every single image that I that I edit that has moving water in it, I always, always, always do something to the water. 
And I will almost always just kind of paint a brush over the, the water itself and just reduce those highlights a little bit because that's a real, real simple way to bring out a little bit of that detail. But just kind of be aware that when you break, when you reduce the highlights, you're going to make that water a little bit darker and you can you can increase the exposure. You can brighten up the whites a little bit, but just kind of be aware of that. But uh, reducing the highlights is a great way to bring back that detail. So uh, I, awesome. I, I don't know if we have more questions. I see questions here. We have a bunch. We have many, oh, many cool. questions. <laughs> okay. So Pete Nevins, uh, assume we have very demanding people here. Pity uh, Nevins, uh, assume you're famil familiar with uh, Dubon ST Bridal Falls. I, am I Do familiar you know with? Uh, what, is uh, it uh, Dubon ST Bridal Falls? I don't know. No, I, I know Bridal Vale Falls in Yosemite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I know. But he's asking, uh, you know, the best the best view from, from the bottom of the site. So you don't know them? Let's go to Diamond no. Star. Uh, I'm going to Iceland uh, and I have a 28 200 millimeter lens. Millimeter lens. Uh, any suggestions on what other focal lens would be worth bringing? Um, if you have a 28 to 200, that's that covers a lot. Um, I would say, you know, the thing about Iceland is you encounter such a diverse landscape to where, you know, and I, and I hate to say it, I would really bring all the lenses that you have really, because you're, you're traveling far, I'm assuming to, to get to Iceland. And the last thing you want to do is, you know, not bring your wide angle lens and then you get there and, and I'm going to, I assure you, you'll need your wide angle lens. But I would say, you know, if, if you have a focal length that is longer than 200, I would definitely bring that because 200 is not super long, but if you have 28 to 200, that's going to pretty much cover you from a, the, the wider end to a, you know, mid, mid range telephoto, but I'm a huge fan of uh, super telephoto lenses. So I love 400 millimeters, 600 millimeters to create those real intimate scenes where you can kind of really compress or create that illusion that you're compressing, bring that background to foreground relationship together. But um, yeah, I would say 28 to 200, bring that. And then uh, anything longer that you have uh, would be would be great as well. Awesome, thank you. Donna Millet, uh, do you prefer to mostly aim for top to bottom focus or a specific area? Um, I think that question has to do with focus stacking. Focus stacking, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So when I when I focus stack, I really don't think about from top to bottom. I think of foreground to background. So I'll take an image for the foreground, whatever's closest to my lens. Then I'll take an image for the mid ground, and then I'll take an image for the background, and then blend those together because depth of field doesn't really work top to bottom it's kind of the depth the distance from your lens to whatever's in infinity in theory but yeah that's how i do it that's cool uh, shadow b do you ever use both the nd filter and the polarizing filter um i usually don't no no mainly because so when you're using a a polarizer Polarizers naturally stop a little bit of light depending, you know, this is a circular polarizer. So when I have the polarization on full, that's going to stop about a, a, at least one stop of light, maybe a stop and a half of light. So a polarizer is in essence kind of like an ND filter as well. And for the shutter speeds that I usually go for, I usually don't need to stop even more light because remember, I'm, I'm always in that 125th to 1 5th of a second, which is pretty easy to achieve that shutter speed and still create a, a reasonable exposure most of the time. But I yeah, always have a polarizer on. Shooting on cloudy days also helps. So. Yeah. And I, can so I just say one thing? I just thought about this. I yeah. want to mention this while we're talking about polarizers. There's, there's a, at least I used to have this tendency of, you know, I'd slap a polarizer on and I would start rotating it trying to figure out where max polarization is. And that's where I would leave it. When I would see that that polarization was at its max, that's where I would say, okay, now you're using it right. But that's really not, I'm not, I don't want to say that's not the right way to do it, but sometimes having a little bit of sheen, a little bit of reflection in a scene will create a little bit of depth as well. So I would just encourage you to not always try and figure out where 100% polarization is and then lock in there. Maybe figure out where 100% is and then maybe dial it back a little bit to maybe 75% polarization 
and just see if you like that because re removing all reflection and all sheen off of shiny surfaces in the leaves is good sometimes, but leaving a tiny, tiny bit sometimes creates a little bit of depth in a photograph as well. So I just wanted to, to add that in. Very nice tip. I, uh, I didn't ever think about that. Yeah, very really cool. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Uh, Philippe Ducon, uh, do you use uh, HDR? No, no, I really don't. I um, I used to years, years and years ago. I should do it a, a little bit more often now because I do know that the HDR engine inside of Lightroom is actually way better now than it was in you know three or four years ago. And I know a lot of um, uh, professional photographers that are now doing exposure blending and just letting Lightroom automatically combine it together as opposed to manually doing it inside of Photoshop. But I personally, I, I don't do a lot of HDR. I'm almost always trying to figure out how I can capture a, an image in just, just one time, one photograph. Awesome, thank you. Wes Spencer, do you use anything in particular to protect your tripod in water or plastic bags, uh, zip ties? No, no, I don't I do not do anything like that. I Maybe I should, I'm, I'm pretty rough with, I don't say I'm, I'm rough. I take care of my stuff, but I have a, I should say I don't maintain my gear very well. So um, no, I, I don't put, I don't protect my tripod at all in the water, but what I will say, hold on one second. I'm going to show you something. Sorry. So this is a, a cool tip. So when you have your tripod legs, yeah, you can see that tripod legs in the water, you should extend the bottom leg first. Because the thinking here is that you don't want the joints below the surface of the water. Because when these are below the surface of the water, they're going to get sand and all kinds of goop in them. And they're not going to twist well. They're not going to lock well. So whenever you are uh, photographing anything in the tripod leg is in the water, always extend the smallest tripod leg first. And just be aware of if there's a way to keep these joints out of the water, do it. Because it's going to save you a lot of heartache. I, I used to always just naturally grab for the biggest and then I would stick all of this underwater. And then what would happen is the next time I go to undo these, they are completely just jammed up with sand and muck and all kinds of stuff. So that's something that'll definitely help you out. Cool, cool, cool. Jabuz uh, Tekirg, could you talk a little bit about focusing and bracketing the waterfalls? Uh, so I, I always use, you know, F11 to F16, which always creates a, a lot of depth of field. So I will usually focus a third of the way into the scene. That kind of seems to be the, 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 you know, great starting off point. But whenever you're photographing anything, I think one of the most powerful things is to take your, take an image and then review the image on the back of your camera and zoom in, zoom into your foreground and make sure it's in focus. And if that's in focus, zoom in the background and see if that's in focus. And if it's not, that's going to tell you that you need to either A, stop down your aperture a little bit, or B, move your focus point to a different part of your scene. But reviewing that when you're on location is imperative because that's going to give you the ability to make a change. But when you get home and you notice your foreground soft, there's, there's nothing you can do at that point. You're just going to have to have a soft foreground. But I usually will start put it, by put, putting my focus point a third of the way in, into the scene. That's a good starting off point. But it has a lot to do with how close something is in your scene as well. If you have a rock that's, you know, <clears throat> half a foot from the front of your lens, that's going to create a lot of focusing issues for you because there's no way you're going to get that rock in focus and your background in focus in a single shot. You'll have to focus stack that. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry, sorry. Yes, oh, you're good. Fantastic. Uh, Dave Gillap, have you ever done any astrophotography waterfalls in the foreground? If uh, so, you do have any suggestions for doing this well? I wish I had some tips for you. I don't. I don't really do much in the way of astrophotography. I. Uh, it's. I don't know. It's just something that. Um, you like the sleeping. Uh -huh. I like That's sleeping. Cool. I do. I, <laughs> I do enjoy sleeping. I actually find astrophotography. I have the utmost respect for astrophotographers. It's. It's hard to do. It's not an easy thing to do. And 
I feel like I'm still trying to get better at daylight photography. Maybe once mm -hmm. I, I perfect that, I'll move to Astro. But no, I, I don't do a whole lot of Astro. And the few times I have, I was just photographing the Milky Way and there and there was no, mm -hmm. no moving water at all. But I can yeah. imagine that that would, pro, that would pose a whole different set of challenges. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because with the Milky Way, you need to shoot from you know, 10 to 25 seconds yeah exposure so you want to get that shot in one in a single shot it, oh, yeah. it's all about Very yeah yeah it's all about you uh, to... planning well your shot i would say and yeah. uh also you can plan your shot and to have the moon above the horizon so you can uh, add light you know from the side or uh, in our in the right angle to the waterfall waterfall in one single exposure, you might get both detail in the in the sky and, and the waterfall. But you know, 10, 20 seconds, uh, yeah. the water will look super, super smooth. Yeah, you you'd almost have to do a twilight blend where mm -hmm. you get your composition set up and after the sun sets and things get you know fairly dark, but there's still a little bit of that blue ambient light, take your photograph for the waterfall and then wait a few hours. And then when the Milky Way comes out, you take your exposure for the waterfall and then blend the two together. That's uh that's in theory probably the best way to do it, but uh, it's easier easier to say than to, than actually do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, oh, <laughs> anybody actually, else? Is, you guys, you want I to learn how to photograph? Oh yeah, yeah. That's your phone? No, it's it's my watch. It happens to me all the time where I'll 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 <laughs> I'll hit my watch or something, and then it'll serial just start asking me questions. It just said it didn't understand us, but <laughs> anywho, I digress. <laughs> I just want to mention that if you guys want to learn how to photograph Milky Way, just go to our website in the academy section. You'll find a huge Milky Way photography guide that will help you learn everything from inspiration, planning, shooting, and gear. Okie dokie. Um, more, more, more. Oh, a lot of questions. Um, one question about the scouting. Uh, harsh caps. Uh, how do you research fine waterfall locations to photograph? So, um, you know, I, depending on the state that I'm in, a lot of times, so let's say when I'm in North Carolina, I'll just type in into Google, like top waterfall locations. And I think every state has got a gajillion articles that are written about the waterfalls contained within it. But I, that's usually where I start just in Google and just look for, you know, popular waterfalls and then kind of go from there and build off of that. And then just just read. I I'm a kind of a researcher. I I mm -hmm. research things to death. So mm -hmm. I'll if I'm going to a state that I've never been and I want to photograph waterfalls, that's exactly what I'll do. I'll just start with Google and I'll just research and research and research. And also looking in Instagram, and you can search for things like you know West Virginia waterfalls, and it'll pull up waterfalls. And a lot of times, if you just kind of search through these photographs, a lot of times people will will write, you know, what the, where the location is, or maybe if you look in the comments of that uh, photograph, people will say, oh, that's, you know, whatever waterfall, and you can mm -hmm. kind of figure it out there, but it's all done off of internet searching. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, mean, also calling or going to the digital center uh, helps a lot in, in yeah. an area. Uh, people, I find people in the States very friendly in the, in the visitor center. Uh, yeah, usually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Valerie LeBlanc, do you meet off the water or off the surrounding landscape? Spot metering or another? So I usually like, use uh, matrix metering, so taking in the, the light from the entire scene, but um, th that's all I, I ever do. I, I never spot meter or anything like that. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, Paul Larson. I use a 10 to 20 millimeters zoom on a lot of my images using a crop sensor camera for an effective 15 to 30 millimeters range. My polarizer is a non-starter at these apertures. How can I deal with no polarizer? I think I don't understand the question. Do you understand yeah. it? No. No. Because it mixes apertures with a... Okay, Gord Tomlin, uh, what are the main factors you consider when choosing which waterfall to shoot? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I 
really, I would just, I would say the attractiveness of the waterfall. So like, there's some waterfalls out there that are, are super popular, but mm -hmm. to me, maybe it just like, I, I don't find just water just pouring straight over to be mm -hmm. super exciting sometimes. So something like, like Niagara Falls, Niagara Falls mm -hmm. is a massive waterfall and it, it's huge, but I, I personally don't find it to be the most uh, attractive waterfall out there. I pers personally like waterfalls that have very interesting things going on inside of the waterfall itself. So like striations of water falling down, maybe trickling across a little bit of moss and things like that. So those are kind of the things that play into my mind as to things, waterfalls that I find that are, are very photogenic. So basically just whatever I think is, uh, is exciting is those really the waterfalls that I'll kind of seek out and try and figure out more information about. So just all personal taste really. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, William, my, my is, uh, do you write down your impressions while on location to recall later for post-processing? Um, I don't. I don't. I probably should, though. I um, I know a lot of people do bring like little little notebooks or maybe jot mm -hmm. notes down. Um, I don't. I I think I'm pretty I don't I don't have the best memory in the world, but I do recall how I feel when I'm mm -hmm. on location with a very uncanny, uh, I guess, longevity when it comes to memory. So like I can I can look at a photograph that I took eight years ago. And I can recall exactly when I took it and how I felt when I took it and what was going on in my life when I took it and everything. And I don't really know why. It's just it's, it's something that um, I've always been able to do. And I think it's one of the things that it's why I'm always talking about creating emotion in, in photography, because when I look at an old photograph, I can literally immediately transport myself almost back to that time when I took it. Mm -hmm. And I can feel exactly what my life was like at that time. It's 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 kind of weird to describe. I'm I'm adding to the fact that I feel like I'm kind of a weird guy as I'm saying these things. <laughs> really? <laughs> this, this guy, Mark. <laughs> well, if you're here uh, talking today, you you're a nerd. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think, I think nerds are great. It's awesome, and uh, I suppose your your approach of editing when editing, you, you try to convey that that emotion. That yeah, felt. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I try and portray exactly the way a location made me feel. You know, I, I don't really, I, I, I don't consider myself a documentary type of photographer where I'm trying mm -hmm. to capture exactly what the scene looks like in real life. I want mm -hmm. it to be very similar to real life, but I also want to kind of enhance it a little bit. I want to enhance the things that excite me the most. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Hey, Gabby Shane, uh, two questions. Uh, what about uh, lens stabilization or vibration reduction? Do you use it? So if um, if I am in the water and the, the flow of the water is strong enough to where I think it is shaking the tripod to a point that is creating blur in my, my images, yeah, I, I will turn on the in-body or the optical image stabilization to see if that can help out a little bit. Mm -hmm. I know it's kind of a common thought track that if your camera is on a tripod, you should always turn off in body or optical stabilization. And in theory, you probably should. But I find that if you're shooting near moving water or if it's very windy out, a lot of times turning that on, even though you're on a tripod, will help uh, kind of smooth out any type of vibration you might be encountering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. And the last one, Russell Williams. What is your opinion on focus stacking? Ah, I, I love focus stacking. It's um it, it's it's one of those techniques that really kind of light bulb moment, that aha moment for me, because a lot of times, you know, you hear things and you just assume they're very difficult. And for me, focus stacking was one of those things. Mm -hmm. But when I learned how to do it, and I've got a, a probably two videos on my YouTube channel all about it, I was blown away by how simple it was. And it is very powerful. It really is. But as my photography has kind of evolved a little bit, I don't do, I don't create as many compositions that require focus stacking anymore. So um, I think it's an, an imperative skill to know how to do, but it's just not something that I, I do all the time, mainly because I, I try and get everything in a single shot most of the time. 
but um, focus stacking is, is uh, it can sometimes be your best friend or your awesome. worst enemy. <laughs> it's good that you had friends. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh man, thank you so much for for uh, you know spending uh, one hour and a half uh, with us. Uh, today. Is it already been an hour and a half? Yeah, one hour twenty four and twenty five minutes already. What is it? T time flies when you're having fun, isn't that the saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I really appreciate it, Raphael. Thank you so much for for inviting me and and everybody that took the time out of their day. I know everybody's busy, so I really appreciate you carving out a little bit of time to to hang out with us today. It uh, it really means a lot. So thank you. Yeah, so we still have uh, 265 people uh, here. Oh, really? Wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, hey. So, <laughs> yeah, hello, everyone. I'm Thank so you so much for I'm watching. <laughs> Mark, any other you know, last words before we say goodbye? No, no. I just, um, I, I, I really appreciate it. I, I, I fully understand how busy everybody's life is. And I'm always completely flattered when I hear, like you just said, 255 people right now that are still listening. That 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 means a lot to me. So I really appreciate you uh, making the time to, to hang out with us today. And if you have any questions or if you want to hang out with me on a workshop, here's my mm -hmm. shameless plug. My website, markdannyphotography.com. Uh, my workshop page has all the details related to that. And uh, of course, if you are not subscribed to my YouTube channel, I would greatly appreciate yeah. it if you did. And uh I guess that's it. Those were my those were my plugs. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, uh, fantastic. Yeah, guys, if you want to learn, be Mark. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. He's a he's an amazing uh, presenter and teacher, and uh, it uh, makes uh, difficult things easy. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for thank you very much. your time here, your sharing. Uh, all you have inside, so uh, I do really appreciate this. And well, it's time to say goodbye. So, guys, if you like this video, give a like, subscribe, you know, all these things, and I'll see you next Wednesday with another video. You will have very poor sound. I <laughs> think next week's video is going to be horrible, the sound, but it's going to be uh, hopefully uh, useful. And uh, that's it. And remember, they have the power to imagine, plan, and shoot legendary photos. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Mark. Bye, everyone. See you another time.